Hello everyone, I'm Mitch Rich, the Ultra Historian. It's finally time to conclude my plausibility review of S.M. Sterling's A Domination of the Draco. If you watched my last two videos, I've already proven why this alternate history is implausible, but I still think it's worth a read. Why, you ask? Well, for one thing, I think the author knows his books are implausible. Sterling has said on multiple occasions that he meant the Draca to showcase what would happen if everything turned out as badly as possible. Thus, what if the worst product of European imperialism, South Atlantic slavery, never went away and instead thrived? The Draca were meant to represent the worst aspects of Western civilization and present an evil counterpart to the United States, who rejected slavery in our timeline, while the Draca embraced it in theirs. The historian Frederick Smoller found this idea pretty powerful. In an article discussing the first three Draco books, he said, The trilogy is illuminating for a number of reasons, one being that it powerfully suggests that no special providence ensured a liberal and democratic modernity, another because it rotates American culture a fair number of degrees, and he argues that in a different context, certain of its original elements, for example, race-based slavery in a dynamic and otherwise egalitarian culture, could have intensified and mutated, rather than be rooted out or slowly wither. If the Draco trilogy works for a reader, is because the reader is persuaded that this history could have happened, which is how all conventional alternate history works. Of course, I would disagree with Frederick that the domination of the Draca is plausible, as Sterling laid out, but that doesn't mean the idea of Western civilization falling isn't intriguing. In fact, when the books were written, it kind of seemed like Western civilization was about to fall. When Marching to Georgia was published, the Soviet Union, the quintessential evil empire for Americans, still existed and carried out harsh measures to maintain order both at home and in their client states, much like the Draca. The idea that they could fall in a few years later seems obvious now, but most Westerners were unaware of how bad things were on the other side of the Iron Curtain at the time. Meanwhile, America had suffered a few black eyes recently, such as the fall of Saigon, the Watergate scandal, the AIDS crisis. Thus, it's plausible to think that someone at the time could see that America was about to lose, collapse, fall, much like the Alliance for Democracy did in the Draco books. Then we have South Africa, which at the time the first few books were written was still under an apartheid government, where the white minority ruled and the non-white majority were denied basic rights. Although condemned by the world, South Africa was still one of Africa's wealthiest and most powerful countries. They even for a brief period had nuclear weapons. More importantly, they existed as a reminder that being a well-off democracy didn't always require you to be socially progressive. Thus, the idea of the Draca enslaving all of humanity becomes a little more possible, even if it's not plausible. Okay, so as a concept, maybe the Draca work, even if their backstory doesn't make sense. But what about all the cliches I mentioned? Yeah, there are a lot of cliches in the Dracaverse, including space-filling empires and evil Afrikaners. But Sterling also subverted many other popular cliches. For example, the usual cliché of the good guys always defeating the evil empire doesn't happen in the Dracoverse. The domination is victorious in the end, without a Luke Skywalker around to blow up the Death Star. Meanwhile, Draco characters can also be quite affable. They can care about their serfs and respect their enemies. They are also environmentalists and seem legitimately upset about what happened to Earth after their final war with the Alliance. Yes, they can be cruel, exceedingly so, but their cruelty always has a purpose, and even the Draco will intervene if they think one of their own goes too far. This makes the Draco's villains even more unsettling, because they aren't just evil, brainless caricatures that you usually find in dystopian fiction, like in Hunger Games. Sterling addressed this in a 2008 interview after being asked what fascinates readers about the Draca. Sterling said, Well, it's supposed to be a dystopia, but any society that lasted that long would have to have some attractive features. Besides, part of the challenge of using the bad guys for POV was to force people to identify with them and then go ick mentally. In fact, there are a lot of alternate historians who went ick, and that had a very major impact on the community. Admittedly, I'm not the only alternate historian to criticize this series. Some have even tried writing more realistic versions, such as AlternateHistory.com's founder and administrator Ian Montgomery, who wrote Draca 2, which features the map I'm showing you now. Hell, even I in my youth experimented with changing the history of the Draca. Just check out this map I made featuring a mashup of the Draca and Turtle Dove's World War series. This is a work of fan fiction, and I'm not the only one who created such a thing. I discovered multiple Draca fan sites and even a role playing setting in the Dracaverse while researching this video. And then there is Decades of Darkness. First published in 2004 by an AlternateHistory.com user named Jared, Decades of Darkness is dystopia where the early death of President Thomas Jefferson leads to the Embargo Act of 1807 never being repealed, which causes the New England states to secede. Without the balance of free and slave states, the United States becomes an aggressive and expansionist slaveocracy, much like the Draca, which was intentional since Jared wanted to create a plausible version of the Draca. Jared concluded the timeline in 2009, but its style and theme were highly influential on other members of AlternateHistory.com, and it won multiple Turtle Dove Awards, the site's annual award. In fact, such criticism of the Draca is so widespread that even Sterling was forced to acknowledge it. In that previously mentioned 2008 interview, Sterling quipped, There's a small internet industry approving that the domination couldn't happen. 
I consider this a compliment. How many people go on at great length trying to prove that vampires and werewolves don't exist? Oh, please. This is 2017, and we still need to convince people the Earth isn't flat. I'm sure there's someone on the internet right now explaining to someone else that werewolves and vampires aren't real. Nevertheless, the Draca aren't plausible. There's no getting around that fact. And yet, it doesn't mean you shouldn't read the books. As a nightmare version of Western civilization, the Draca can be quite fascinating to read about. Granted, if you enjoy plausible alternate histories, the Dracaverse might not be for you. But if you like frightening dystopias, sci-fi action, and influential works of alternate history, then you should check out S.M. Sterling's The Domination of the Draca. Whew! I'm finally done with this plausibility review. Let's end it by saying, if you like what I do, please comment, subscribe, share this video, or support me on Patreon. I'm Matt Mitrovich, the Alternate Historian. Bye!